Fine. So this is what uh, we started discussing yesterday, uh, and I uh, mentioned this as this idea of quantum parallelism, right? That you can now input states in superposition, and in some sense simultaneously compute multiple values in one shot, right? So today we're going to see how you can exploit that property in an algorithm, right? And that's what this Deutsch algorithm is all about. We discussed parts of it yesterday. We'll go over it again today. Uh, so with today's class, this sort of um, overview introduction is complete. As you can see, I have not given too many details yet, right? Starting next week, we'll get into the uh, formal definitions, some of the linear algebra definitions that we'll use. We'll discuss postulates of quantum mechanics that we need, and we'll sort of get into the formal theory of this starting next week, okay? So let me just mention uh, some references. Me, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, could you please kind of summarize the quantum parallelism? Yeah, yeah, we'll discuss that again today, no? I mean, I'm going to discuss the parallelism and the speed up today. Oh, I just sure, want to sure. mention, yeah, sure. Just mention some references here. So what I've discussed so far, you can find in this book by Nielsen and Chuang. Um, I hope everyone has access to some copy of this, okay? Either a hard copy or a soft copy. I'm sure there are soft copies floating around all over the place. Um, but this will be our reference, main reference textbook, main reference and textbook. And uh, this discussion is basically chapter one, in particular section 1.4.2, okay? This is where this idea of parallelism, the speed up, uh, query, complexity, all of this is discussed, okay? Um, people wanted to know about the physical implementation of this algorithm. So this has been, anyway, maybe I'll mention that at the end, but for now, let me suffice it to say that this will be the main reference for what we have done this week overall, okay? This chapter one in Nielsen Chuang is a nice read. Um, it, without getting into too many details, they describe the qubit, they try to give you a flavor of what are the different things possible and what is not possible uh, using quantum bits, okay? Right, so let's recall the so-called Deutsch problem. And I described this for a single bit function. So you're given some f of x. Um, sorry. Oh, my pen is acting up suddenly. Um, where X is, of course, some, just a single bit. Okay. Um, and for a single bit function, you know that either f of 0 must be equal to f of 1, in which case you would say that the function is constant, or f of 0 is not equal to f of 1, in which case you would say that it is balanced, right? And the task is to find whether the function is constant or balanced, right? And this is what the classical um, oracle model of computing does, right? So the classical oracle model assumes that you have some device, okay, which is often called a black box because you don't bother what is inside it, okay? This is some device which is going to compute the function f of x for you. It could just be a calculator, whatever it is, right? You input x, it gives you f of x, right? And in this kind of a model, so typically in classical setting, how do you say a given computational task is easy or hard? You talk in terms of GPU cycles or something, right? But if you want to abstract it out as a theoretical computer scientist, you will say, what is the um, size of the circuit, right? How big is it? Um, how deep is it? 
right? So these are the kind of metrics that you would use to describe complexity. Now that is called circuit complexity, right? But in this kind of a scenario, and this task is particularly suited for this kind of an Oracle model, you don't bother with circuit complexity because this circuit is kind of given to you. The black box is given to you, right? So the complexity of the problem The complexity is defined in terms of number of queries to the black box. Query simply means how many times do I have to invoke or use the black box? Do I, how many inputs must I give? Um, before my task is complete. A different kind of task you can think of in the query complexity, for example, is a search problem. Okay. Uh, is my audio okay for everyone else? Is it, or is it breaking for everybody? It's fine. It's not breaking. Okay, then I proceed. Um, so, how many times do I need to how many different inputs do I need to give before my task is complete? And as I was saying, a different uh, kind of task you can think about is search, for example, right? And suppose the black box is the is the uh, basically evaluates the the thing that you're searching for. So, for example, I'm looking into the IITM directory and I want to find out Prabha Mandiam's phone number, right? So the black box is going to do that evaluation for you. Given any phone number, it's going to match it uh, with the name and tell you whether this is Prabha's phone number or not. Right? How many times different inputs do I need to give before I reach my correct answer? Right? Before I can decide that, yes, I do have Prabha's phone number. Right? A different task you can think about is, for example, finding factors of a number. And the black box will simply check whether a given number is a factor or not. And then you can keep inputting different numbers and checking whether you have a factor or not, right? I'm just giving you different kind of tasks where you can think of this query com uh, idea that you, you are given a device which computes a function. That function may just be matching a name to some other name. It may be evaluating whether a number is a factor of something. It may be evaluating whether a given root, the distance of a given root is shorter than some number. Like if you want to identify the optimal root, for example. In this case, it's simply evaluating the value f of x given a single bit input x. Right? So I hope the idea of a query is clear now. And complexity is defined in terms of how many times do I need to query the black box. Right? Is this idea clear? Someone asked me this question about query. No. Okay, good. So um, in, in this particular, so for the Deutsch problem, classically, number of queries is two, right? So you need to input zero, find f of zero. You need to input one, find f of one. And then you can decide whether f of zero is the same as f of one or whether it is different, right? So I also just want to point out this something I mentioned yesterday also. This is called the Oracle model of computing. And this goes back to this idea that there's an all powerful Oracle. Um, so the, apparently who was this goddess in, 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 in a Greek temple, this is a temple of Delphi. Uh, you can go read up about it for fun. But the idea is that she knew all the answers, right? And you simply had to ask her and you had to ask her the right questions, right? So the complexity is defined in terms of how many questions do you ask before you get the answer that you seek, right? So that's where this uh, name comes from, right? So now let's see quantumly what happens. And I mentioned yesterday that you need only a single query, right? That if you had a quantum black box, so the Deutsch problem is the simplest example of a quantum oracle, okay? And the claim is that you need only one query to the quantum black box. Okay. 
And how do you construct the quantum black box? Remember that you're given this function f. Okay. So I'm going to construct a quantum gate, which I call u sub f. Okay. It's like this controlled not operation, except it's controlled, uh, of course, on the first uh, input on the control register. But you're no longer doing an XOR with respect to X, rather you're doing an XOR with respect to F of X, because that's the function, that's the information that you seek, right? So this is what this uh, quantum black box does, that if my inputs are X and Y, and I simply use the generic labels X and Y to denote the bit values inside, right? The zero and the one, then it does nothing to the first register, the second register, it outputs y xor f of x, right? Slightly different from the c naught, which outputs y xor x, right? Okay, now how do I make use of this black box and show you that um, you need only, yeah? Um, isn't this still two input, but for Sorry? one query? Um, to the black box, we are still have two inputs, but one query. So ah, no, 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 no. This is a two input, two output gate, right? But how many different inputs do I need to give before I can conclude whether the function is constant or balanced? That is the query complexity. Like okay. I said, you don't bother with the complexity of the black box itself. So the black box certainly the quantum black box is much more complex than the classical black box, right? So you don't bother about the complexity of the black box. That is the rule of the game, right? So this is indeed a two input gate and a two output gate, whereas in the classical case, it was a, um, but classically also, you don't know how many gates are sitting inside this F. Huh? It's just that whatever this is, it's a device. You give one, of course, it's a single input, single output. The only difference is this is two inputs and two outputs, but it is not, um, okay, so let me explain the algorithm. So it's not as if you are giving an input zero here and an input one here. In fact, that's not even going to help you. Okay, the point is you're going to input something which is a superposition of zero and one, and that's that's enough, right? You don't need to give two different inputs. You don't need to um, run this circuit two times. Whereas in the classical case, you'll have to run this circuit twice whatever the black box circuit is. Quantumly, you just have to run it once. Is the idea clear? Yes. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ma'am, so effectively, I mean, this is let's a circuit that has been provided to me, and I have yeah. to implement a Deutsch algorithm using the circuit in, a, uh -huh. in the most effective manner, right? This is what the game is. No, 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 this, okay, so Deutsch, no, so the, the, the innovation happens in two steps, right? Your creativity comes out in two steps. Given F, how do you construct the right oracle for this? So this was Deutsch's construction, that this is the kind of two qubit quantum gate you need to become your black box. So, okay, let me tell you this. So this UF need not even be a single gate. And in fact, when you, uh, you will at some point in this course, uh, implement this on IBM Q, okay? So IBM, uh, I suppose many of you know, has some of these quantum processors on the cloud, right? So you, you can all go and create accounts already. And if you want, you can actually just read up. Uh, IBM Q has a nice write-up on the Deutsch algorithm itself, and maybe I'll provide a link to that on Moodle, where they will show you um, for different input sizes, what, how do you actually break, uh, uh, construct this UF? Okay, so yes, there, there will actually be multiple gates involved and it will not be like some single gate. Okay, so it could be a circuit. But what I'm abstracting out here is the functionality of the quantum black box. And this was Deutsch's contribution, right? Yes, indeed, they have an n qubit, exactly, yeah. So you can all go and look up IBM Q, not now, please, but at the end of class, and you can see how they actually implement, I think they run a three qubit Deutsch algorithm, okay, uh, or a three bit Deutsch algorithm. Anyway, um, yeah, so Deutsch contribution is to abstract out the functionality of the quantum black box, right? That it has to basically do this controlled operation 
where it does the second register extracts out the value y x or f of x. This was Deutsch's first contribution. The second contribution is how does this, how do you make use of this um, gate, const, uh, this functionality in combination with a superposition principle? Okay, and that's what I'm going to tell you next. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, the black, uh, the quantum back black box, which is a U of F, U of F, mm -hmm. consists of multiple circuits, but for the sake of simplicity and for this algorithm, we are just taking C naught as an uh, one of the gate inside this U of E of right? Indeed, the C naught will be one of the gates inside this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So what goes inside this box, like I said, will not be our concern, right? We are at this point wearing the hat of a theoretical computer scientist, and we simply ask. See, this is what algorithm design is about, right? You don't get into the nitty gritty of how every gate is going to be implemented. Now, that is for the uh, hardware guys to do, right? What you are concerned about is what is the desired functionality you need to solve a particular problem, right? And this was Deutsch's contribution that he said that you need a, a functionality of this form that there has to be a quantum gate. See, I still call it a quantum gate, but you must remember that a single quantum gate in hardware may need multiple operations, multiple steps. Okay, I hope you appreciate that and you will appreciate that when you start doing things on IBM, which I plan to do in a few weeks time once you have some of the basics done. Okay, but you're welcome to go and look at the IBM page to see how they do the Deutsch algorithm. Okay. Um, okay, so let me proceed now. We're already at 920. So let me. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, ma'am, will the internal structure of the gate also depend on the function F since not even once. Have we mentioned the uh, structure of uh, F? Indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly like the classical case. No, I didn't tell you what F is. You didn't ask me what are all the different uh, uh, components you need, whether you need op amps or adders, or I don't know what, what are all the classical electronic components you need to implement F. I'm not getting into the details of all of that, right? It is some classical circuit, finally. Similarly, the F will obviously feed into this. In fact, that's why I'm saying when you actually run the algorithm, you will see that for a given F, how do you construct the corresponding oracle, right? The circuit construction will indeed depend on that. And obviously there are easier oracles to implement and harder oracles to implement. There's no doubt about that. But this model of complexity does not bother about the hardness of the oracle. It simply wants to know given the oracle and assume that the oracle is somehow cheap for you to implement how many times do you need to fail okay yeah. okay any other questions okay let me proceed see i'm i'm happy to have this discussion about oracle and stuff now itself because it is an important uh, uh, computing model and finally one of the important quantum algorithms which is the search algorithm heavily relies on this oracle principle, right? So it's good that you guys are thinking about this and asking me these questions. So I don't mind spending this time. Uh, Ma'am, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, f of x in the case of quantum oracle shouldn't it have- Can you speak up please? Sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, so uh, the f of x in the case of quantum oracle, yeah. shouldn't it have two inputs because the uf here is uh, two in two inputs and two output functions. Yeah, indeed, the quantum oracle has two inputs. So my quantum oracle is not F, it is UF. This is the classical oracle F. Corresponding okay. to this, I have a quantum oracle, which is which is a gate of the form UF with two inputs and two outputs. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now uh, let me actually then show you the Deutsch circuit itself. So yesterday I already mentioned, so you will anticipate that in place of X, I'm actually not going to have a single qubit, but I'm going to have the so-called plus state, right? The superposition state zero plus one. But what is more in the position Y as well, I'm going to have another superposition state, which is zero minus one. Okay. This is UF. And now the question becomes, what is the output here? Okay. 
So let's try to evaluate this. This involves a little bit of bracket algebra. Just follow it for now, and we'll revisit this um, again once we have the all the formalism uh, sort of formally defined. Okay, so recall that if I have x, y, then under the action of this uf, this becomes x, y, xor, f of x, right? So now what is my input? So let's expand the input state first, okay? So you remember what we did yesterday as well when we had these kind of superposition inputs. So this is the first register, which is the control register. And this is the second register. So I must mention that in this Oracle game, you don't call this a control and target. Often what you call the first register as the data register, because your uh, black box is after all evaluating f of x, right? This is your x and this is your y, remember. And the uh, uh, quantum black box is also conditioned on f of x, right? So in some sense, this is the data. This second qubit seems to be hanging around for free, essentially. This is what we call an ancillary qubit, okay? Or an auxiliary qubit. You will find that this is a common feature of most quantum algorithms that they will need an additional or many additional ancillary qubits of this form. Okay, um, fine. So, in this particular algorithm, we will initialize the data qubit to 0 plus 1 by root 2, and we will initialize the ancillary qubit to 0 minus 1 by root 2. Okay, so I mean, I don't want to put C and T, I can put data and ancilla. Okay, if you want to just keep track of the qubit registers. Oops. Okay, so I think we already, I already mentioned how you would expand something like this. It's all linear, so this can be expanded out as follows. I can take the half out and I will simply write this as 0, 0 plus 1, 0 minus 0, 1 minus 1, 1. Um, please follow this algebra with me. You'll be doing lots of this during the course, okay? So this is how we expand this, right? Now, uh, after the action of the quantum black box, the state is, so again, linearity. So the halves simply a scalar or a number multiple. So that's just outside. Now I have to act UF term by term, okay? have to act this uf term by term on each of these terms. So I hope you see that what you'll get is this. The first register remains unchanged everywhere. So I will get 0 x or f of 0, right? Which is simply f of 0 plus 1. Again, 0 x or f of 1, which is simply f of 1. I will get minus 0 and then 1 x or f of 0 which becomes the complement of f of 0, right? So let me write this out maybe one step. So I get 1 x or f of 0 and 1, 1 x or f of 1. Is this step clear? If you have a question, please stop and ask me right away. I'm just acting uf term by term, okay? All right, so now I'm going to denote 1 x or f of 0 as f of 0 bar, right? It is simply the complement, right? And 1 x or f of 1, I'm going to write it as f of 1 bar, okay? So let me write it like this. So the state after uf is therefore equal to half zero. Now, 
I'm going to take terms common, right? Where the first register is zero. And you see that I have f of zero plus f of zero bar, okay? And I have one f of one, um, I'm sorry, it's a minus sign here. And I have one f of one minus f of one bar, is that right? One f of one minus f of one, okay. So now, as I said, I need to do something about this output state um, in order to extract out this information, right? So let us now look at the different use cases here, right? The point is somehow this, I claim that this output state has information about whether f of zero is the same as f of one or not, right? So where does that information really reside? Okay, so let's check this out. So now let's look at the two cases. So if f of zero is equal to f of one, right? Then what happens? Okay. Okay, so let me call this state something. Let me just call this psi, okay? So I'm going to call this state a psi state here. Okay. And I'm going to show that psi has two distinct structures depending on whether the function is constant or balanced. So if f of zero is equal to f of one, okay? Then this is what psi is going to look like. Um, I'm going to now split up this half again as a one over root two and one over root two. So I'm going to write this as one over root two, zero. Okay, maybe I'll write this in two steps. Um, so half zero. Um, okay, so maybe you already see this. When f of zero is equal to f of one, these two uh, parts of the second register become the same, correct? This, this is f of zero minus f of zero complement. This also becomes f of zero minus f of zero complement, right? And now if I split the half as a one over root two, one over root two, I hope you see that the state is simply one by root two, zero plus one by root two, okay? f of zero minus f of zero bar by root two. Because this is the common second register term. So the first register is simply in this superposition now. Oops, there's a one over two outside. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you guys see this? Right. Now, if f of zero is not equal to f of one, what happens? So, if f of zero is equal to f of one, then they are both either zero or one, right? But if f of zero is not equal to f of one, then what this implies is f of zero must actually be equal to f of one complement, right? We are just talking single bit functions. So if f of zero is not the same as f of one, if the function is balanced, it means that f of zero must be equal to the complement of f of one, right? So now just substitute this here. You will find that again, you, now you have to map f of one bar to f of zero, and you have to map f of one to f of zero bar, right? So what happens? What is the change from this state? This time the data qubit is minus. Exactly. Yeah, indeed. Very good. So you will now notice that uh, the data qubit becomes 0 minus 1 by root 2 with f of 0 minus f of 0 bar because you see the f of 1 bar became 
f of 0. So there's a minus 1, there's a minus sign that comes here. f of 1 became f of 0 bar, right? And once again, there is a relative minus sign out there. So minus f of 0 bar. Um, so just if this step, you may have to think about it a little bit, just uh, write out the algebra fully, expand it out and see, and you should be able to get this, right? So now you see, this is exactly what we wanted. Depending on whether the function is constant or balanced, you see that the first register is either in the state 0 plus 1 by root 2 or in the state 0 minus 1 by root 2. And this is not an overall phase. This is actually a relative phase. So the information about f of 0, whether it is equal or not to f of 1, that is information about whether f is constant or balanced, right? This has been extracted into the relative phase of the data register or the data qubit. And this is the key idea behind the Deutsch algorithm, right? So you have queried in superposition, which means you have made your inputs into superpositions, right? But the cleverness of this whole thing relies in the fact that if you do this uh, linear algebra steps, then you find that you have actually extracted this information about whether the function is constant or balanced onto the relative phase of the first register. So let me now write down the final, uh, the complete circuit, okay? So this is what the complete Deutsch circuit looks like. Um, Actually, when this is not complete, there are some additional gates, which I will write later when we revisit this. But for now, let's just simplify this and write it like this. Okay. So this is the, this is the Oracle or the black box. And what we have shown is this register is in zero plus minus one by root two. And in fact, the second register actually has the same state. Right, it's in the same state. It's f of zero minus f of zero bar by root two. So you see, f of zero again can be either zero or one. So the second register basically will be zero minus one by root two or one minus zero by root two. Correct. But the first register will be either zero plus one by root two or zero minus one by root two, depending on whether the function is constant or balanced. So this register is simply f of zero uh, plus f of 0 bar by root 2. And now, what do you have to do here? We have to measure. So, was there a question? Yes, and why you are using this uh, f0 plus f0 bar by root 2? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Minus, right? Yeah. Oops. Thank you. Um, and in both cases, it's the same thing, right? In both cases, it's a minus. Whether f of 0 is the same as f of 1 or f of 0. Yeah, it was just a typo again. Thank you. Um, so let me just explain, expand on this part. Right? How do you do this measurement? Or what does it mean to say measure? Oh, I'll me. explain this. We'll revisit again. Yeah. Sorry for interruption. But sure, that's uh, okay. in second part, I, to be honest, did not understand why F0 is F1 bar. 
when you took the case too? Well, okay, so f of zero is not equal to f of one. So let's say f of zero is zero. Then what is f of one? One. It has to be one, right? You but, have only two uh, possibilities. We initially, when we started, we said that we do not know the specific form of the function, right? But when we are doing yeah. this case, we somehow are saying that the range is also zero and one. Oh, this is a Boolean function. Yeah, I already told you that. Oh. Oh, I told sorry. you that this is a, a Boolean function. And it takes inputs, binary inputs and gives binary outputs. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry then. Yeah, 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 yeah. The classical functions always are binary. No, I mean, and uh, uh, you really don't construct functions which take a binary input and give you some other uh, symbols as output or higher dimensional symbols as output. Right, so you're taking binary inputs, you get binary outputs. Of course, the way to extend this problem is to go beyond single bit function, which means your input now has multiple bits. And in fact, that's what I'll just mention next. We'll do the full blown algorithm uh, once we get through some of the basics of you know tensor product and things like that. Uh, okay, I just want to talk about this measurement briefly. So the way you would measure is Basically, the idea is that you have some device out here physically, which is going to tell you whether you had the state plus or the state minus, right? Remember, ket plus is 0 plus 1 by root 2, and ket minus is 0 minus 1 by root 2, right? And these two states are distinct states. Uh, a more technical way of saying this is that they are orthogonal states, much like how your real dimensional, three dimensional space, X, Y, Z axis are distinct, or just like how in a polarization kind of scenario, the 45, 135 polarizations are distinct, just like how the horizontal vertical polarizations are distinct, right? So because they're distinct states, one can conceive of a quantum measurement, which is going to tell you whether the state that was realized here was the plus or the minus. So the final step is simply to measure and decide, uh, measure and rather not decide, but uh, uh, get the information about whether, so let me say measure and see whether the output is plus or minus, okay? And plus, if you get plus, then you know that the function is constant. And if it's minus, then you know that the function is balanced, right? So think of a quantum measurement as something like the toss of a coin or the roll of a die, right? So it's as if you run this algorithm and then at the end, you're doing this measurement, which is like the toss of a coin. But of course, the, you know, there's something that decides now whether the coin is going to collapse into a head or a tail, right? And what decides is whether the function is constant or balanced, okay? So is the bare bones idea of this clear? That you query by superposition, extract the phase information, or extract the information that you want into a relative phase, right? and then do a measurement. And of course, so we now have a quantum algorithm. Which is twice as fast as the classical. Okay. Um, and when I say as fast, I mean in the Oracle sense in the sense of black box or oracle complexity. Um, questions? Yes, ma'am. So yeah. basically in the previous lecture, so uh, you had talked about like we can separate out these two plus and minus kit states based on this, basically this uh, ortho orthogonal property, right? We can perform Correct. a measurement scheme because they are separated by 90 degrees. Yeah. But yeah. as the same doesn't hold true for, you know, the uh, so, kit one and the minus kit one states because they are essentially 
parallel Correct. to each other so yeah. there is no yeah. possible yeah. okay okay and ma'am the, the the normal uh, zero and one kit states can mm -hmm. we consider these individual states to be uh, the real qubit or the rebit states if you consider them as rebits that will really limit your computational power right but, so but for example you can do doge right okay. but you cannot do uh, quantum fourier transform but ma'am as per the mathematical definition when we are considering that alpha and beta belongs to the set of real numbers then we are referring that uh, state to be the rebit state mm -hmm. so if i consider only the k0 notation i can treat it as you know uh, alpha equals to 1 and beta equals to 0 which are essentially real numbers so can i consider the individual 0 and 1 k states to be rebit no, see, I, I don't know they're asking two different things, right? First of all, when I write down this superposition alpha zero plus beta one, I wrote down saying that alpha and beta are complex numbers, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, now, the, but what you may be asking is whether I can represent zero using just real entries, okay? Now, I can define any state to be zero. For example, I can say if I want to be very perverse, I can start my whole quantum computation uh, thing by saying that the basic ket zero is actually going to be a two column vector of the form one i and one is going to be of the form one minus i. Okay. Now these are also orthogonal actually, as we will see in subsequent lectures when I define what orthogonality is in a product and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a matter purely of definition or convention that instead of taking something complicated like this, I'm making my life simple and saying ket zero is one zero and ket one is zero one. Okay. But I will allow for all possible complex superpositions of these two things. Okay. okay. So that's the simplest, I mean, uh, basis states we are considering correct, for the correct, sake of correct. simplicity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay yeah. Ma Thank you. Ma I could equally well have started yeah. like this. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Ma'am, can you uh, repeat uh, more about this measurement process? Uh, my question is basically if the output uh, is not orthogonal, like these two states are not orthogonal, then the whole thing will fail because you won't be able to make out. Yeah, that. so you cannot measure. So quantum mechanics will tell you. So we'll do, like I said, we'll discuss postulates of quantum mechanics maybe next week. Uh, you cannot measure. If you have two states which are not orthogonal, you cannot distinguish between them. Okay. So that's what I said. All of this goes into the algorithm design. So the information that you seek must be of the form that it can actually come out in a measurement. And the Deutsch algorithm just works beautifully that way that it very nicely extracts this phase out here. It maps it to exactly two orthogonal, one of two orthogonal states. And depending on whether the function is constant or balanced, you will project or you will collapse into one of these two states finally. So, so for any application of quantum algorithm, the I mean the core requirement would be the output should be orthogonal states. Is that well? I wouldn't say that's a requirement, but that's a constraint. Okay, that the measurement oh. can always only project you onto orthogonal directions. That's like any okay. measurement, right? It's just that classically you're used to thinking about orthogonal directions very naturally, but quantum okay. mechanically you have all possible superpositions and states, but the measurement always will collapse you into one of a set of orthogonal states or will always project you onto orthogonal directions. So you have to keep that in mind in designing your quantum algorithms. All right. Uh, in case, if, in yeah. case if they're not orthogonal, like if you make some kind of a repeated measurement, and uh, I mean, is that also a possibility? Uh, that will just give you approximate values. Then. That will not give you precise values. Then you'll have error probabilities and you'll have to say, um, it looks like the state is close to this, but it is not that and so on. You, you can only talk in terms of statistics then after that. All right. Okay. In fact, yeah, we will see. We will see some algorithms where we do this kind of things also. Okay. 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 Right. So okay. let me just complete this discussion. So hopefully you're convinced now that we have a quantum algorithm, which is twice as fast as the classical one uh, in this Oracle setting. Right. Now, twice as fast doesn't seem like a great... Uh, speed up. So let me now tell you the uh, the let's let's now sort of extend this argument to like I said an n bit 
Boolean function. So let me talk about what is called the Deutsch Josa algorithm. This is probably one of the earliest examples of a physicist, theoretical physicist, and a theoretical computer scientist collaborating. Josa is a computer scientist at uh, Cambridge, and Deutsch is a theoretical physicist. And so they then extended this same argument and showed that you can do this. So now let's say this f of x is an n bit binary function. I'm going to take a few more minutes. I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, so what do I mean by that? It means that x is no longer just 0 or 1, but rather x is of the form x1, x2, etc., xn, where each xi is now a single bit. Right? So this is a string of n bits. Okay? Again, the question is the same, although I must tell you that when I have n bit functions, it is not that constant or balanced are the only possibilities. So now what does it mean to say the function is constant? So if f of x uh, is constant, it means that f of x is the same. So it's either 0 or 1 for all input strings x. And if f of x is balanced, then f of x is 0 for half the inputs, okay? And f of x is 1 for the other half. Okay, so you see this is now a kind of artificial uh, uh, constraint or you know an artificial sort of definition. When you had only a single bit function, it was more natural because the function has only two possibilities, right? It's either constant or balanced. But now you see this is a very specific requirement, okay? So in this case, what we say is you're given a promise, okay? That f of x is either constant or balanced. Okay, and of course you're given the black box f itself, right? So now, how many queries do you need? to decide whether f is constant or balanced. Classically, how many queries do you need? To power n, n to the power n minus 1 plus 1. 2 to the power n minus 1 plus one. How do you get that? I mean, uh, you said that it uh, it could, it, in mm. case it is balanced, right, it would mm. be zero for half of the possible input combinations. So mm. if mm. two raised to the power n is the total number of input po possible combination for the n string, right? So it's half yeah. is two to the, uh, so it's- Correct, uh, yeah, I see, yeah. Correct, yeah, I see plus, your argument. Plus one extra. Yeah. Correct. So I hope everyone uh, realizes this argument. See, there are how many n-bit binary strings are there? There are two to the power n such strings, right? Classically, suppose I query half of them, which means I input two to the n by two, right? That's what the first term here is, right? So this is two to the n by two. That's half the number of strings, right? Either I already know by the time I do this, that the function is not constant, right? Because I already start getting other outputs. But it's possible that all these outputs are, are you know, uh, zero, which means they're all constant. However, 
the next one could be a one. The output could be a one. So you really don't know until you have queried half plus one number of strings, right? So you have to basically input these many strings before you can decide whether f is constant or balanced, right? Um, what Deutsch and Josa showed, and I will stop with the statement, is that quantumly, this again needs only one query. Okay? And so now the speed up in terms of this Oracle model is exponential. Because what required something which was order two to the n, right? Now n, little n is the size of my input, right? So what required something of the order two to the n now only requires order one or constant, which is actually just one query. And the reason that you need only one query is because the same idea goes through no matter what the size of your input quantum space is. Instead of a single qubit, I now have n qubits. I simply have to make an appropriate superposition of these n qubits for the data register. I again have to pick this single ancilla register, put it, put the, um, you know, throw the input again in an appropriate superposition. And then the same, uh, do this qu same quantum oracle, do a single measurement, and that decides for you whether the function is constant or balanced. So quantumly, this, even the n-bit version requires just one query, and we'll see this in detail once we, we need a bit more of the mathematical machinery to actually work this algorithm out. So let's build that over the next few weeks and actually see for ourselves that the speed up is exponential, right? So like I said, this was a result which was in um, Proceedings of Royal Society. It's a very easy, nice paper to read. So there are two papers in the Proceedings of uh, the Royal Society, one which is the original Deutsch paper and the other which is the subsequent Deutsch Josa paper. Let me just give you the original Deutsch paper. This is volume 497, 1985. Okay. So this is where this promise of quantum speed up really started and uh, the subsequent Deutsch Josa algorithm is a bit later, this is 1992. And 92 is also around the time that Shor's factoring algorithm came up, the quantum factoring algorithm. And so this is when people really sat up and started taking notice that there is, you know, uh, that this idea of quantum speed up is something that is real, right? Okay, so let me stop here. Like I said, starting Monday, we'll start going back to basics. We'll discuss the linear algebra concepts that we need. We'll discuss the quantum mechanical concepts that we need. Then we'll get into um, the nitty gritties of various quantum algorithms. Questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma uh, yeah, no, uh, so, yeah, okay, I will go ahead. So uh, when uh, in the examples, uh, ma'am, you're mentioning about inputting the superpositions. So mm -hmm. physically, um, how are we are going to input a physical, uh, physically, like how we are going to provide a superposition as an input. This is theoretical, right? Indeed, but like I said, there have been several practical implementations. So actually somebody asked me about um, practical implementations last time. So guys, I'll upload these papers on Moodle uh, by this weekend. But let me point you out to two things. So this has been implemented in what are called ion trap quantum computers. This is around 2003. And it has been implemented more recently in what are called NV qubits. Uh, I think this is like 2016 or something. And of course, on IBM Q, um, so you can implement this, okay? But to answer your question, how do you, so let's say you start with zero and one, and this is given by your physical system, right? These are some 
spin levels or polarization states or things like that. How do you go from here to here? So there is a quantum gate that does that, which is called the Hadamard gate. So physically, all you need to do is to implement the Hadamard gate. So the first part of your Deutsch circuit actually looks like this. So that's why I said that's not the complete circuit. This is what it looks like. So in any quantum algorithm, you will find that you always assume that all your qubits, in fact, start in zero state. So I can even make this a two-step thing where I start with zero. How do I get ket one from zero? We've already seen that, right? What is the gate bit we can use? Bit flip gate. X gate. Correct, the X gate. So I'll follow up the X gate with this so-called H gate. I have not yet described for you what it is. I'll do so when we get to the gates part of it. But suffice it to know that there is a gate which will do this, okay? And then I do UF and then I get the output. And then I measure. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there are other questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one question yeah. in the in the uh, two uh, one bit example. Mm -hmm. So in that, uh, I have difficulty understanding. So we are claiming that we need to give only one query to the black uh, to the quantum black box, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look at the uh, the actual expressions, we are evaluating mm. both f of zero and f of one. In one shot. Uh, I don't understand how how we are doing that in one shot. Like, uh, it is going to make two eva two evaluations, right? Because the inputs are different. No, this is, that's what this circuit is telling you that I can create the superposition here. I'm not putting zero separately and one separately, that completely defeats the purpose. And let me point out one more thing. Maybe I should have done this in the lecture. Unfortunately, people have left by now. But since you asked, let me tell you this, right? While you measure here, what you the information you get merely tells you whether the function is, uh, so plus or minus will merely tell you whether the function is constant or balanced. Right. Note that you do not get any information about what f of 0 is or what f of 1 is. Do you understand? Right. So you're actually not evaluating f of 0 itself or f of 1 itself, but you know, the comparison. In fact, it's actually something like f of 0, xor, f of 1. And that is what this algorithm is evaluating for you and extracting that out in the phase here. Oh, OK. Right, right, right. The classical black box was actually evaluating f of 0, then evaluating f of 1, then comparing the two, and then you decide whether it's constant or balanced, right? Okay. But now you input the superposition. The output is also a superposition, but it's just two distinct superpositions depending on whether the function is constant or balanced. But this does not give you any way of evaluating what is f of 0 or what is f of 1. Right, right. Yeah. So okay. that's a bit of a trick thing here, right? It's So what you're evaluating is what's called a global property of the function in one shot using quantum parallelism. But you're not really evaluating the function itself. Yeah. Yes. So ma'am, uh, because of super, superposition, uh, we are not uh, evaluating the, I mean, it's automatically evaluating both the values at once. Correct. That, and it's it? able to compare. So this comparison is like an interference. You can think about this as a kind of interference that is happening. And so uh, that's why this information is coming out in this phase here. Right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's plus okay. or minus. Yeah. Okay. Ma'am. Yeah. I had a question. Yesterday, uh, we had applied the, say, plus state and mm -hmm. the zero state to the U of F get right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and in the output we got uh, get zero f of zero uh, plus, plus get uh, yeah. one f of one That's by correct. root two. Yeah. Now yeah. for any f of, means any f, like there will be four possible uh, f's right uh, for a binary system. So for all those four combinations, all this like uh, gets states are orthogonal to each other. So why don't we perform a Two state measurement directly to get a result. No, no, no. Um, 
So you're saying that you get, oh, you get zero f of zero plus one f of one. So why mm. don't you measure that? Is that your question? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, because any for any f, these will always be orthogonal, right? So the four states which we get for different f's, they will be orthogonal to each other. One second, let me write this out. So I'll tell you what the problem with what you're saying is. Right, this is what we did yesterday. Okay, now which register do you propose to measure? The first or the second? Can't we like measure both of them together? Because they can means they can be measured, right? And what information so, will that tell you? How will that tell you whether f of zero is the same as f of one or not? Remember, so, the aim of the game is not to evaluate f of zero or f of one, hmm. but rather to find out whether the function is constant or balanced. Uh, Ma'am, like what I was thinking was, uh, say, let for for example, f of zero is say some one and uh, f of one is zero. So we'll get a state of zero one plus uh, one zero by root two, right? If uh, so, this is the case where they are not the same. F of yes, zero is one and f of one is zero. Okay, this is one and possibility. In some other case, uh, suppose they were the same and equal to zero. So we'd have got the state zero zero plus uh, one one by root two. No, that in this case they are not the same, right? They are again different. So huh. in this case f of zero is one, and f of one is zero. In this case f of um, yeah. So in this case f of zero is zero, and f of one is one. So and this doesn't yes. tell you anything, right? So both of them are orthogonal, but both correspond to the same uh, this thing, which is that f being const uh, balanced. So, ma'am, I we have two orthogonal to... states, both of which correspond to the function being balanced. Hmm. So I was thinking we could have listed out all four states like this, and the all remaining states... two. Yeah. So write down the remaining two states. The remaining two yes. states are actually not orthogonal with respect to these two states. Because what is the remaining two states? I will have 0, 0 plus 1, 0, right? Oh, yes, and they are not orthogonal. And the other so one, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, exactly. thing will be yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so these two, you have done a quantum mechanics course, is it? Mm, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. EP so. Ah, okay, fine, fine, fine. And mm. you did it with Arul, is it? Mm, yes, ma'am. Okay, that's why you know this. Yeah, so these are not orthogonal. So this is not orthogonal oh, right, with respect to A and B. Yeah, indeed, that's the problem. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me stop recording now. I guess half the class has left.